caught in the note. We're live. <laughs> Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to Navigating a Career Pivot, how to masterfully translate your valuable skills to an entirely new field. Hi, I'm Mary Helen Gillespie, the Managing Director of Get Connected, one of the co-hosts of this incredible day in, along with Boston Magazine. And I have to tell you, I am the queen of career pivots. So I am delighted that our guests this afternoon are going to be sharing their expertise on how to how to move and make moves that are professionally and personally um, empowering. So let's introduce our guest. Elizabeth Case is the head of strategic investments, talent acquisition at Wayfair. Hello, Elizabeth. How are you today? Good afternoon, Marilyn. I'm, I'm well, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time and your, your expertise. And Jessica, Jessica Dowling is the Associate Director, North American Builds and Operation at Wayfair. Jessica, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am fine. I'm delighted <laughs> that we can sit and have this delightful chat with um, and and help educate and empower uh, and also learn from each other, not only for our audience. So speaking of the audience, why don't we start uh, the, uh, uh, the, the party? I have a question for both of you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your current role, and the journey that you took to get here today? Jessica, would you like to begin? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I am currently the Associate Director of Builds and Operations for Wayfair North America. So I'm responsible for all of our office build outs, um, our retail and our operations for all of our office sites throughout North America. Um, prior to this role at Wayfair, I was in marketing for some time. And then prior to that, I have had a number of different roles in different organizations. Um, including Crate and Barrel, Blue Homes, um, and then in my former life, I was in the interior design industry. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Lots cool. of pivoting. Yes. Yes. Um, that's terrific. That 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 is terrific. Elizabeth, tell us about your journey. Sure. So I have really spent my whole career in finance. I started as an oh. auditor. I've worked as a financial controller. I've worked as an investment banker, but my current role is in talent acquisition at Wayfair. And you know, there I look at uh, ways to spend wisely and strategically. So talent yeah. acquisition being recruiting, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we give the right tools to our recruiters to hire efficiently and to bring the best people uh, into Wayfair. Wow. That, so yes, you have both made the jump. It's amazing. So for, for our audience, when, from your experience, um, where do you begin to make a career change? And how do you know, like you both have gone from multiple verticals, how do you know what industries to uh, explore? Do you want to begin, Elizabeth? Sure. So I should say that I've also taken a long break from work and to raise a family. And so in a way, those years and, and you know have allowed me to think about what I really enjoyed in, in my previous positions and what I wanted in my future uh, employer and in my future position. So where did I start? I started, you know, really looking at my, my skills, my experience, thinking about what I truly enjoyed doing and I concluded that I wanted to move away from finance, but I really wanted to use you know, what I saw as my toolkit and apply it somewhere else. So when you think about a career pivot, I always think that there might be two ways uh, to approach it. It might be that you're looking to apply the skills that you already have in a different environment, or it might be that you want to expand your toolbox. You want to learn something mm. different. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And did you ha did you feel that you needed to undergo any additional training or education when I you made the jump? Absolutely. I, I considered, you know, going into, uh, you know, back to school, um, you know, looking at uh, degrees, maybe in, in, uh, in talent, in human relations, because this was the field that interested me. Um, and eventually I decided not to, but it, I think it's a very personal decision. Interesting. Yes, because I went back, I started out in journalism and I was a journalist for my first half of my career and went back to school and got an executive MBA because I wanted to go on the business side of journalism, but I never landed there. I landed in the internet and somehow from there, long story short, I found myself a um, compliance risk officer at several local um, banking giants. So I was, I did, and I couldn't have done any of that if I had not gotten you know, the MBA. So Jessica, tell us you, um, what you think. Um, how, how do you know, in your opinion, what industries to explore? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I'll, I'll, very much what Elizabeth is saying is, is really boiling it down to what you enjoy. One of the questions I ask when I interview is like, what gets you out of bed and excited to go to work in the morning and really thinking about that. And so for me, I've always enjoyed working with people. I've always been in somewhat of a service role, um, working collaboratively with other teams. Um, and then I've always really enjoyed like the tangible creation of something. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, prior to my current role at Wayfair, I was in marketing and it's really exciting to work with other teams to create a campaign, launch the campaign and then see how it's how it's performing in in my current role. Um, you know, I strategize with other uh, business stakeholders to understand what their vision for a site is. I work with third party architects and general contractors to bring this vision to light in to life and into a physical, you know, Re, uh, physical space that people get to enjoy. So that's really exciting. So a lot of this, the same things, um, the same elements are there, working with people, um, creating something. Uh, it's just kind of figuring out what lane or type of work you want to do with that. To your point about going back to school, um, I actually came over to this role um, eyes wide open, not really knowing what I was going to sign up for. And I think Wayfair is really great at hiring generalists that just like to figure things out. And so it's been really fun. Um, but most recently, I went back and I got my master's in construction management to kind of sharpen those skills. So cool. it is nice to have it, it is nice to kind of be in a role for a little while and really understand like, oh, this is actually something that I really enjoy doing. And then going back and getting um, kind of the next level of education in that in that area. Interesting. That is really, really interesting. So what would you say, um, uh, Jessica, is the greatest resource uh, individual should consider before going into the pivot? Is it a professional? Is it personal? Um, soft skill, hard skill? What's the what do you see as the the answer? Yeah, I mean, I think probably your network is your greatest resource. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. When I was thinking about changing roles out of marketing, I, I can't tell you how many people I had coffee chats with, and you know, mm -hmm. um, how many people I spoke to outside of my organization. I've even reached out to people on LinkedIn and and asked if I could have a conversation with them about their role, having no idea, like they've never met me, um, but <laughs> I'm just really curious, kind of like what they do, not looking for a job, but really just trying to understand what they do and how they do it. So. You know, I think really just networking, getting out there and really understanding from the people that do the, these types of jobs, what the job really looks like. Um, I think a lot of jobs look really interesting from the outside. I know at once I wanted to be a nurse and then I remember like oh. helping someone bandage something up and I'm like, ew, <laughs> that's yeah. definitely not the role for me. Um, so it's really important to really do your research and talk to people that are in that industry and really understand what that industry is like to really figure out if it truly is something that you would be a good match for and something that you would like to um, to, to move your, your career towards. Very much so. Elizabeth, your thoughts. What is the greatest resource an individual should look at? 
I don't know if there's one great resource, but you know, not to to repeat what Jessica said, I think your network is really essential. Mm. What I want to point out, though, is that it's not only your professional network; it really can come from anywhere. Think about your neighbors. Think about the people that you meet. Yep. You, know, you know, let's say if you have children on the playground, start to talk to people. And what I I would also um, recommend is enjoy the process because it, mm. it is a process, mm. and it is it can seem daunting really when you start the search, right? To so your question of how do you figure out the industry? I didn't know that I wanted to join Wayfair in particular. What I knew was that I wanted a, a particular role. So you might not actually be able to pinpoint the industry per se. It might be a role that you have in mind. And for some people, it will be the industry and you know figuring out the right role within that industry. But what is really important, I think, is to to think about it as as a, a process. And you know, you have to spend time doing your research. You might as well enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think to the flip side of that too, there might be a company that you really want to work for. And a lot of companies are like Wayfair and they're big in the sense that you can kind of explore different jobs within the same organization. So your target might be working for a large company and having the, the opportunity to explore different roles within that organization. And to your points, the working the network is so important. And Every job I've ever had came from my network. Mm. It never came, never, you know, from, you know, applying for ad, from, you know, classified ads, um, going on websites. No, everything always came from my network. And I teach um, media and uh, digital media to graduate and undergraduate students. And they look at me like, I'm nuts when I say you're going to get your job from your network. Build your network now. Look at who's sitting next to you. Look at your roommates. Look at who is um, uh, in class. Start building the network. So I totally agree with with, with both of you. Um, and to the point about the um, switching careers, what surprised you the most? when you actually found yourself landing where you la where you are now when you look back um that first day when you walked into the new role were you what surprised you the most elizabeth sure I, I have to say you know since i took a break from work i think in my mind there were almost two types of challenges there, there was the challenge of going into you know, back to the workforce after having taken that break. And what surprised me there was that, you know, it was just as if it had been just yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, you know, it, my brain didn't go into freezing mode and in you mm -hmm. and start again. It was just it's, it had always been there. Uh, and so that was very gratifying, obviously. But then, you know, switching to then a, a uh, job in, into uh, in talent acquisition, what surprised me the most was that there are so many skills that are applicable that are transferable and, mm. and people tell you that but you have to find the right environment the right people who will believe in that because you know when people talk about internal mobility it might be just a marketing role in the in the us versus a marketing role in europe but when we talk about really career pivot it's about being able to transfer your skills your knowledge to a role that is slightly or completely different from what you've been doing and do you recommend in your work, um, daily work, do you mm -hmm. find yourself um, working with pivots or pivoters or pivotees? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the beauty at Wayfair is it, there's, there are a lot of people around you who have made career pivots. And, and in fact, I think if you look at people who have been with the company for a certain number of years most of them have made a career pivot and this is what what is keeping them at the company it's this opportunity to be challenged to to work on new uh new positions new roles new scopes um you know that keep you at the company what well, excellent jessica what was your impression or what did you feel that first day when you started this new role yeah, I think a lot to what Eliza is saying is, is how many skills were transferable, even though I had no idea of the jargon and everything else that was happening in the conversation, the, the basic elements were still there. It's 
project management. It's just the different types of projects that you're managing, working cross-functionally with, with stakeholders, make sure, making sure you're maintaining stakeholder expectations. So a lot, a lot of the, the elements are there. It's just a different application that you're applying the same skills to. And uh, what um, do you find are the skills that you have added since you have been in the, your current roles? What would you say is now um, a critical part of your, uh, pr your professional portfolio, Elizabeth? I would say it's probably a lot of contextual knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. really. So it, you know, it's about uh, the the industry itself or the, the sector you are in. I knew nothing about talent acquisition. You know, I I had interviewed people, recruited people, but the, really, what happens behind the scenes? You know, the systems that are in place, um, the technology, the everything was new, and that's actually the exciting piece of it. Okay, and Jessica. Yeah, I mean, I think in my previous role, I was uh, more customer facing, working directly with our customers and seeing how they react. I think in my current role, I'm working more closely with our leadership and our senior stakeholders. And so that's been a really great experience and really understanding kind of the right ways to approach different conversations with them, the right ways to, um, the most effective ways to um, present options um, and propose things to senior leadership, kind of knowing the right time, aligning timing with the, the organization's overall goals. So you're not proposing something out of left field that it really kind of dovetails into what the organization is thinking about at that specific time. So that's been a really great way to kind of expand my skill set. That's an excellent point in talking about being um, on top of corporate culture mm -hmm. and making sure that you're listening and you're absorbing and you're interpreting um, and that you're in sync. But also, would you say that with all of this, you're also being very forward thinking and strategic? Yes. In order. Yeah. Okay. Can we talk a little about that, Jessica? Yeah. I mean, I think a big part of my job is presenting options. And so it's, it's, you know, as much as you try and read the tea leaves and see where people are comfortable, you never really know. Yeah. And so I think a good way to kind of navigate through that is to present different options. Like option one is a little bit more forward thinking, a little bit more out there, something we've never done before. Option two is something a little bit safer, something that we're used to. Um, and then, you know, option three could be something totally as an alternative option. And so it's it's been really helpful instead of just going in with one option and you know feeling very defeated if they don't like your <laughs> option. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like you have three, and there's and even if they don't land on one of those three, they could at least react. They have something to react to. They can say, "I like parts of this one. I like a little bit of this one, and I like a lot of this one." And so it gets the conversation going. It gets the ball moving, and then you can iterate from there. Okay, and Elizabeth, how do you get the conversation going? So it remind me exactly what what. Uh, well, we're we're talking about um, working, you know, knowing the corporate culture, working um, with a strategic, uh, forward thinking approach when you're starting to pivot, and you have. You, okay, does that make a little more sense? Sure. So you know, I would say um, it's it's also about understanding uh, people's positions, understanding you know what maybe is on their mind, what the problems are that they're trying to solve themselves. And so in a way, I don't know if, if it's so much about adapting to the culture, but really being in tune with, with the position, what is at stake there, and the challenges or the, the, the issues that you're trying to solve. Okay. And at, to add to that, and this is something that is very, very um uh, I don't want to say popular, that's not the right, yeah. is found uh, in many women uh, is imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and the feeling that, you know, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. I can't go there. They won't listen to me. How do you work through imposter syndrome? In, and I mean, this could be like a five day you know, <laughs> seminar, I realize that. But what are some key points? Uh, to get out of that mode 
what how do you count what what do you recommend how do you counsel elizabeth sure so i will say for me it it was about really making sure that i had the support network and i didn't mention it but you know in in a way there is a company that has helped me actually make the transition and it is reach Harris. it's a company that has partnered yes. with Wayfair to bring back you know returnees to the workforce and with the reach Harris model i had a group of of women going through the same transition and that was immensely helpful and i don't think i would have been as successful if i hadn't had this group of women but your network is not only friends or people going through the same experience you you may find also people who are going to help you within the company who may be able to, to sympathize empathize with you you have your your families your friends it's important to have i think people that you can share challenges and successes with because it is going to be tough and you know imposter syndrome i don't know if it ever goes away there's, <laughs> yeah. there's always a time when you wonder am i good enough am i not good enough and some of it will come from you but you know it's it's good to have people around you who are who are uh, vouching for you and who who keep you you know on your toes yes it takes a village is my you know mm -hmm. mantra it takes it it takes a village um i've heard wonderful things about recharge and the way that it does support women coming back to the workforce. Um, was was that recommended to you or did you find that yourself? I just found it really by chance. I was Googling, uh, you know, returnship and I, I stumbled upon, it's, it's a reach hire. And, um, you know, the application for the returnship program was there and I, I just applied. And there are a lot of other organizations that work similarly with companies uh, in, in helping bring a, a diverse workforce uh, you know, to, uh, employers. Okay. And Jessica, what's your, how, when you're dealing prof professional, personally with imposter syndrome, um, and professionally, uh, how do you break the tape? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is just knowing that everybody feels that way. It's not just you. Um, I think also for me, it's 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 being comfortable, being uncomfortable, and in allowing yourself the grace to not know everything all the time, but also considering that your employer is hiring you because they want you to become a subject matter expert in what you're doing. And so <laughs> while you don't have the, you may not have the answer right then and there. You know, make a commitment to the team that you'll you'll dig up the answer, you'll you'll research this, and you'll get back to them, and come back to them with you know really knowledgeable information, so they they know. They can count on you to to find information when you don't have it right at your fingertips. Um, and and you know, to Elizabeth's point, just having a network. I can't tell you how many times in meetings I slack one of my coworkers, and I'm like, what What does this acronym mean? What is this? You know, and just like <laughs> having people in the organization that you can reach out to and act, ask quick questions when you don't have the the information um, is really helpful. Um, do you think there will ever be? imposter syndrome is something that will go away with younger generations as as the workforce expands um as culture expands perhaps in the post pandemic you know realignment of what organizations are looking like do you ever yeah. think do you think that imposter syndrome will eventually fade out I think to kind of going back to what Elizabeth was saying, I think having a good company culture where it's okay to not know everything and it's okay to work together to find answers really helps dissolve some of that when you, you know, I mean, I work uh, for two great people that don't have all the answers and they're the first to say, like, if I knew what I knew now, then I wouldn't have made this decision. And they're very humble. And it's, it's just really nice to uh -huh. work in an environment where everybody knows that we might not always have the right, the right answers all the time. And even if we do make a mistake, we're at least going to learn from it. And I think it's really the culture around you that helps you kind of tear down that, that syndrome and, and kind of um, dissolves that, that need to feel like you need to be an imposter because you, you feel safe um, mm -hmm. in an, in the environment that you're in. Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think Jessica said it perfectly. Uh, I think the the environment is really crucial. I remember interviewing, uh, you know, researching a company and maybe through somebody in my network meeting with somebody in, in, in talent. And, you know, as much as they talked about maybe, yes, being open to 
a let's say a non-traditional background for the position at stake you know in effect i don't think they were really but because you know through the questions and all and and maybe the answers that i provided it was clear that it didn't seem like it was a good fit so i think really finding that culture uh, that world culture that will allow you to to test the ground to ask questions um i think that's very important so as you're pivoting what um what's your uh bullet list what should be the bullet list that you start off with when you make it when you make the decision it's time to change industries how do you how do you approach that? I, mean, I think the first thing you want to do is just really self-reflect and analyze yourself and think about, you know, why do I want to make this change? What am I in this pivot? What am I trying to move away from and move towards? And really kind of thinking about what those elements are that you're trying to move towards and then doing your research to figure out which industries have those elements, you know, you shouldn't, you should, there's certain roles you shouldn't work in if you don't like interacting with people. I mean, there's some basic things there that, you know, you can start to figure out through not even thinking about the industry, but just thinking about kind of certain characteristics of what you like to do in a role and then thinking about what roles have those characteristics. And Elizabeth, um, once you're in that new industry, what do, what do we need to be mindful of in terms of standing out in in the new role, in this new profession, in this whole new vertical, where you may get some resistance from others because you're not just new on the job, you're new to the profession. You know, I don't know if you have, if, if there are sort of bullet points or, or you know, um, sort of secrets that that uh, we can share about this i would say that maybe to to build on uh, what jessica said earlier it's also important to remember that it may not happen overnight and mm -hmm. it might be a you know a two-step process so it might mm -hmm. be that the the industry or the job that you want uh is not the one that you get right away but it's it's just it's one position that gets you a little bit closer um so i think that's that's maybe uh, you know one one tip where you can then you know get closer to what you want because you you're building the knowledge and so if you think about it I think long term you have maybe a better chance to succeed if that sure. makes sense yes it does because we're talking about bridge jobs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. correct yes. and that it could be a it may not be a one year process it may take a three to five year plan, but while you're involved in it, what you need um, to absorb and learn and realize you're still working toward those goals and you do have the network, the support, and what happens when you're halfway through the pivot and you decide, uh-uh, this is not where I want to go. <laughs> And it's okay. It's okay. But again. <laughs> and it's actually probably better to realize it earlier. Um, uh -huh. But I think every every experience you can build upon, and it's it's uh, it can only add to your toolbox, or it can add to the knowledge that you have about yourself or about the the working environment. Uh, Jessica, you were your thoughts. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think it's uh, you know every every job is a learning experience. Um, and, you know, every job is a place where you acquire new skills and, and also where you learn more about yourself. And I think, you know, even though it, you may have to pivot again, um, it's it's good to have that experience because you're just one step closer to knowing what you really want at the end of the day. So there really is no failure. There's it, it's not you're not going to get an F in pivoting. <laughs> yeah, it's <right>? a journey. <laughs> it's very, yes. very much a journey. All right. We're coming up with the uh, five minute warning. So I wanted to sort of get your your final thoughts on navigating the pivot. Um, what would you have told your what do you, would you tell your yourself at the age of 25 that you now know about professional the professional world? 
um, Elizabeth, what would you have told your 25 year old self? <laughs> that, that was a very uh, long time ago. I would <laughs> tell myself that. We're not look, talking numbers. I know you're you in finance, but no, no numbers. <laughs> you don't know. You, you, you don't know what you don't know. And in a way, it's, it's not even worth making a plan that far, uh, uh, you know, uh, away mm -hmm. because things change. The world changes. The, the, the working uh, world changes. Circumstances do. And so, in a way, I would say focus on, on you know, the immediate sort of job and maybe the next step. Focus on yourself, on getting to know yourself, your strengths, the areas that you want to develop. And don't worry about the rest. Um, you know, Adam Grant, uh, while my wrote this book, uh, you know, think again, and I, I recommend it to, to a lot of people, but it's, it's one of the, the lessons of the book. Don't ask people or don't ask kids what they want to do when they grow up, because you, mm. I think it almost sets them up for failure. Yes. You, yeah. You yeah. change. Yes. You can't be, I watch my nieces and nephews, you know, 16 years old, 17 years old, trying to figure out where they want to go to college and what they want to major in. How do they know? Yeah. What, what, what that pressure is, it, it is so unnecessary. Jessica, what would have you told your 25 year old self? Well, I think again, jumping off what Elizabeth just said is just like, take the time to learn about what makes you happy, whether in life or in your job. And you'll, you know, I've worked plenty of jobs where pretty quickly I was like, Hmm, <laughs> this type of work is not interesting to me. And that was great because I got to learn that. And, you know, really kind of always focus towards what's making you happy, what's getting you out of bed and excited to go into work. And if you're not, if you're getting out of bed in the morning and not excited to go to work, why? Like figure out why, what what elements, what pieces of that job are are not making you excited to go in because there's, there's no better gift than to be able to be excited about what you do for a living because you spend so much time doing it. And um, true. I would, I would just really focus on like what those elements are. And to, to your point, Elizabeth, about asking, you know, someone young what they want to do when they're when they're older, I, I position it more to my children on, you know, what makes you happy? What do you get excited about doing? Like what subjects in school do you enjoy and why do you enjoy them? And like, what part of that do you enjoy? And so I think it's like really kind of figuring that part out about yourself. And then you can kind of figure out what, what industries and career choices align with that. Okay. So bonus question as we're wrapping up first job, mine was a supermarket cashier, <laughs> Elizabeth. Oh, I was a tutor. Uh -huh. I was tutoring kids. Uh huh. Jessica. I worked in a costume jewelry store, and I was an ear piercer, which is terrifying. <laughs> Transferable skill? <laughs> uh, I don't think it's something a responsibility I probably should have had. <laughs> I will tell you that being a supermarket cashier, I still bag gro my my groceries perfectly, and <laughs> the you know the the sixteen year olds who are trying to do it. I look like the crazy old lady who says, it's okay. You can go over to the other register. <laughs> um, it's one of the, um, it's not, it, it's one of the skills I have not forgotten. Yeah. I, um, I waited tables once and there's a lot of skills. There's a lot of ma multitasking. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of things happening all at once that you have to manage that, uh, you know, were great skills to, to learn. Yeah. Don't put, um, the eggs on the bottom of the bag, number one rule to go through. Well, Elizabeth Case and Jessica Dowling of Wayfair, thank you so, so much for sharing your experiences, your expertise. I wish we could go all day because mm -hmm. this was such a um, empowering and enjoyable and educational opportunity. And I would like our audience to feel that they have any questions, they can um, contact me and I'll get them to you um, as, you know, moving forward. This was quite successful and um, it's just, especially in the post pandemic time when pivot is now such a major part of everyone's vocabulary. Um, your thoughts and experiences go a long way. So thank you very, very much. Did you have any other parting words before we uh, close? Any, I would any say, thoughts? I would, I would uh, tell people, just be kind to yourself as well. You know, as I yeah. said, it's, it's not easy every day to, to 
do a career pivot. So be patient, be kind to yourself. Yeah. Excellent. Well said. I agree with yes. that. Yes. Um, that's probably the number one lesson of it all, isn't it? Is yeah. being kind to mm -hmm. oneself and everything will then come. So thank you both. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And for our audience, We'll next be in the expo. So you can, um, Jessica and Elizabeth, will you be in a booth? You will? Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to stop by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So fabulous. So if you have any questions, you can ask Jessica and Elizabeth directly. Um, the expo will be going on uh, for um, about a half hour. And then the rest of the afternoon will roll from there. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Way Wayfair, for this wonderful opportunity. Good night. Bye-bye Thank you for having us.